I'm guessing that when you first heard the name of it, the parable of the wedding banquet and the way Melanie Shapiro told about it, it sounded pretty nice, this parable, but it's actually a pretty awful and violent story when you stop to think about it. I think for many of us it's hard to reconcile this image of an angry, vengeful king with the God of love and mercy that Jesus usually preached. It's hard to believe the gentle Jesus most of us know would even tell it. We might wish that he hadn't, in fact. We might prefer the other more sanitized or nicer version of the story that appears in Luke chapter 14. Luke's version doesn't have any bloodshed and that poor guy who wore the wrong clothes didn't get dragged into the party only to get thrown out again. So it's nicer. No one got bound up and thrown into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. But before we jump to any conclusions about this story, I think we need to check our assumptions. First of all, Jesus didn't precisely say that God is this king who sent out the invitation. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think that Jesus didn't mean this parable to so much describe the essential nature of God, but instead to capture how very hard it can be to introduce the kingdom of heaven to this messed up world. The kingdom of heaven in the future is easier to believe in, I think, than the kingdom of heaven that we hope for when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a challenging prayer to put into practice on this earth. And so I believe this parable was meant to express the frustration that Jesus and his followers must have felt as they tried to spread the good news of God's love and make disciples of all the nations. They were, after all, inviting the world to a wonderful and joyous feast. It must have been hard for them when so often people refused to listen to their message and even persecute them for sharing it. And when you stop to think about it, many of us know the feeling. It's hard enough to be a Christian among other Christians, but it's a very rough world out there, as any kid on a school playground will tell you. That's why I brought the, my kids' drawing here into church with me today. I know many of you can't see it from quite that distance, but I wanted to share it because the CE committee at my last church had wanted to do a project with parables. And um, when we came up on this one, people were ready to throw it out and say, no, we can't do this one with kids. But we went against our better judgment, and we tried it. And it turns out they loved it. The boys especially loved it. There was much bloodshed and violence. And I, you know, in Sunday school, usually all of that gets cleaned up. But this one, there was murder and mayhem, and that's the drawing that's there at the top that my son did of the flaming castle and screaming victims. Don't you have days like that sometimes? <laughs> when your castle's on fire? When the Christianity you learned in Sunday school just somehow didn't quite apply? The world can be a mean and awful place full of wailing and gnashing of teeth. And when life's like that for you, it feels very good indeed to be a person who gets a wayfarer's welcome into the kingdom of God's love, the wedding banquet of Christ's church. And that's the colored part below that you can probably just see the colors that my six-year-old daughter illustrated with the banquet table overflowing with purple and golden flowers. So this is where the brilliance of the parable comes in. She has someone standing, well, she has the king beautifully robed with um, an ensemble decorated with stars of David and hearts and also um, peace signs with a big smile. And the king has thrown out of the feast this little person who is wailing and crying. 
And what we discovered in working with the kids was, you know, it's a really good thing when the hall monitor steps in on the playground and makes the mean kid stop being mean and puts him on time out. This is a God of justice who cares when little ones get hurt. So that's, again, the brilliance of the parable. The man who forgot to wear the wedding garment can remind us of how to be Christ's disciples today. Remember how Paul calls us to put on the likeness of Jesus Christ? That would be the symbolism of the bridegroom at the feast, Christ being the bridegroom. This weekend is Yom Kippur. Just yesterday, our Jewish uh, friends and neighbors were celebrating that highest of high holy days, the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the um, Orthodox Jews still wear a robe much like mine, uh, something they call the kittle, which is a simple robe with no pockets to remind us that we don't take it with us. Because the bridegroom's robe, the robe that he wears first on his uh, wedding day, he also wears as a winding sheet, as a shroud on the day he dies. It's equality that it reminds us of. Much as our choir robes um, are a great equalizer, we cannot know which ones of you are wearing your blue jeans and which ones of you are wearing your designer clothing. We are all equal in God's eyes. So this is the reality that we are called to, this life that Jesus calls us to of simplicity and humility, when we're called to walk with him the way of the cross in solidarity with the poor and the outcast. So ultimately, our highest calling is to be like him when it's hardest to do, when the castles are all on fire. I mean, it's easy to be nice and to be a Christian when everyone is nice to us and we're having a stress-free day. But in the midst of conflict, it's not so easy. And that's why I love this image of the robe. If we can just remember in moments of crisis to stop and to put on the robe of humility, of the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's such a simple thing, but it makes all the difference. Haven't you seen the look on the face of a stranger when they expect us to be mean and we're actually nice? There was a woman like that who showed up here yesterday. Poor thing, she thought it was the day of the Yankee Fair. She felt kind of stupid. She apparently had driven a very long way. And um, she could see that she had arrived in the middle of a wedding banquet. We were having a wedding here yesterday, and she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So she was astonished and delighted when I and the wedding party invited her in to use the restrooms and make a phone call and do whatever she needed to get her on her way. We hope that she comes back next Saturday. <laughs> and in fact, that is what I hope next Saturday that we do. because. The Yankee Fair is arguably the day where we have the most strangers and wayfarers who step onto our church campus. And I think it is the most important thing that we do, that we use this as an opportunity to share God's grace with the world, that we clothe ourselves, especially carefully, in the likeness of Christ as we greet all of those people. And so it's in that spirit of offering a true wedding banquet at our Yankee Fair next week that I want to leave you with these closing words from the fourth and final chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians because I think it's still sound advice for those of us around here. We need to hold on to his, um, his thoughts, I think, as we move into the stress and potential conflict of our setup week, the all-important last six days before the fair. Paul's church at Philippi was a lot like any church today. It had been fighting over some trivial thing or another that is lost to us in history. We can no longer be sure of the exact reasons. Paul is actually writing them to thank them for the money they had sent him um, to help him in his imprisonment, an imprisonment that may have very well been his last for all he knew. So I think you can appreciate the impassioned 
plea that Paul is making in that light. So just think about how you would feel if you were one of the poor people who's, um, who had been the source of conflict, whose names had been read aloud in front of the whole church for the first time when this letter was delivered. And so it's in that spirit that I replaced the names Euodia and Syntyche, which Rich apparently worked very hard to pronounce, and then I took it away from him. And I'm replacing it with some names that are more familiar to us. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, those whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Jean Durrell and Sue Ronan, be of the same mind in the Lord. And yes, also I ask you, my loyal companion, Dave Honeyford, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with John Mangold and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. People of faith, it is a rare thing to be in a community where people say nice things to one another consistently where the things that are good and praiseworthy in one another are called out and lifted up. It is like a glorious wedding banquet of Christ's kingdom, a place where wayfarers feel welcome and know themselves to be beloved children in God's eyes. And this is our calling, to wear the bridegroom's sacred robe, the robe of the host, Jesus Christ as we share with the world the joy of the new life and freedom in God's grace that is offered. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen.